Um, good afternoon. Welcome, everybody, on behalf of the West Virginia Clinical and Translational Science Institute. This is our um, scientific communication series of our research boot camp. Um, I just want to mention the upcoming series we'll have. Um, Dr. Linda Neald will present in October seven steps for writing case reports for clinic clinical literature. And then Dr. Jeff Frisbee in November will present publishing your scientific manuscript tools of the trade. Um, our August boot camp really um, introduced everyone hopefully to the sponsored programs process. And then today our presenter, Dr. Shrews, is going to um, share with us his experiences and wisdom in um, the realm of grant development review and other aspects there, hopefully um, enabling you to become successful or more successful in obtaining external grant funding. So I want to introduce Dr. Shrews. He earned his Bachelor of Science in Psychology from University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia and then followed with his MA and PhD in psychology from the University of Iowa. He began his career at the NIH as a postdoctoral fellow and then rose to the ranks as unit chief and then was recruited to West Virginia University and the Blanchett Rockefeller Neurosciences Institute in 2000. And then he began writing and reviewing grants about that time that he arrived here and has been continuous, continuously, continuously RO1 funded since 2002. He has served on two NIH study sections as well, and he teaches a scientific writing course that includes grant writing to graduate students. A number of them have gone on to receive fellowship awards, and he also mentors a number of junior faculty in grant writing, some of who have gone on to obtain NIH and NSF funding. So he's professor in Department of Physiology and Pharmacology and is the director of the West Virginia Alzheimer's Disease Registry. So welcome, Dr. Shrews. All right, thank you, Dr. Lockham, for that kind introduction. Um, it almost sounds like I'm going to sell you some OxyClean, but I am from Australia, so unfortunately you're going to have to deal with the accent. Uh, I have been <clears throat> in the United States for a long time, but somehow when you move from one country to another as an adult, you don't tend to lose your, your accent. But anyway, um, what I'm going to do today is talking about designing and writing competitive grant applications. and um, this is a disclaimer I, I think I need to make because uh, some people may think I'm speaking for NIH or NSF. I'm not. I'm expressing my opinion and my interpretation of the rules and regulations and NIH and NSF promulgates. And um, this advice actually works sometimes. Um, I have been funded. Unfortunately, I got a not discussed grant report yesterday, so I'm a kind of bummed out about that. But I would say that the point of, of this series and in this particular case, this seminar, is to give people an understanding of what actually goes on at NIH, what you need to do to be able to deal with what goes on at NIH, both from a grant review as well as the grant submission process. And as an overview, I'm actually going to start at the end of the process. I'm going to describe to you in some detail okay, I'm going to describe in some detail how grants are actually reviewed because it's my strong opinion that unless you know how your grants are processed and treated then you really won't know how you need to prepare your grants to be competitive. I'm also going to talk a little bit about how to stay sane in, in, in an insane world because the grant writing process, the grant submission process, is a crazy, crazy world. And um, if, any, if nothing else, I think you need to remember that you, you will, but you shouldn't take it personally. They don't know you, you don't know them, they're evaluating your science. But it's really, really hard when you spend months and months investing heavily in an idea that you believe is brilliant uh, and that you think should be funded, and three scientists say, well, perhaps not. 
Because it's a boot camp, I'm going to use some um, military type of language. So there are some guerrilla tactics that I would recommend. First of all, in terms of grant design, I think it's really, really important that you spend a good deal of time gathering as much intelligence as you can. And what I mean by intelligence is actually learning what reviewers are looking for. It's not just enough to know how to write a grant. You actually need to know what the reviewers are looking for in your grant in order to be able to score well. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about grant writing. It has to be a sustained campaign. If you think you're going to write a grant in two weeks, you shouldn't even begin because it really takes a long time, it takes a lot of thought, and it takes a lot of other people to write a successful grant. And then grant submission, you really do need to know in quotes who the enemy is what NIH is about, what the people at study section are looking for, and where at NIH or NSF you need to submit your grants, because that really makes a difference. If you can funnel your grant to a particular study section that is interested in your work, so much the better. And you can actually tell NIH that you want a particular study section to review your grants. And I should say at this point that I am assuming that most people here and in the, the distant sites are interested in NIH type funding more so than NSF. But they're the two organizations I'm going to be talking about specifically because that's where I have the greatest experience. But in general, this information would apply to m most funding agencies. I'm going to talk a little bit about brand new submission rules at NIH that only came into effect in April of this year that have really changed the landscape quite dramatically. And finally, I'm going to talk about the F word. And in this case, the F word is funding. I'm going to spend a few moments talking about how different agencies make decisions about funding. And it is not a level playing field at all. Certain agencies spend a lot of time thinking about who they're funding. Other agencies just fund from the best to the worst, regardless of the nature of the science. And it's really important for you to know which institutes do that, how they make their decisions, because it will guide how and to where you submit your grants. OK, this is the grant process in cartoon form. You have a brilliant idea. You have to go to the site to upload certain forms that are specific to um, particular announcements. Then you spend months writing, collaborating, editing, and revising your document. You upload it, and then at some point, NIH decides where that grant is going to go. And a study section, a review panel, will assess that grant. Then you will receive your reviews, and in nine times out of ten, you're going to kill somebody because you really are upset about the score or the score, the score you got or you didn't get or the nature of the reviews that you got. And then you go back and do it all over again. That is essentially the process. But I want to spend a few moments talking about the study section, the review panel that um, will examine your document. There are about 20 people in this room. Only three of them, maybe four, but only three of them will have read your grant. The grant is available to everybody in this room, but because every reviewer gets between 10 and 15 grants, they're pretty much inundated with work evaluating the grants they do get. So they're probably not going to look at your grants. Each reviewer receives your grant six weeks before this meeting, this panel meeting. Each reviewer will receive, or in this case, it used to be a box, actually. You got a, <laughs> you got a box of paper, but um, that's when rocks were soft. Things have gotten a little better, and you access 10 to 15 documents or grants on a website. And each reviewer is responsible for reviewing those 10 to 15 grants. Each reviewer writes a review of each grant that he or she is reviewed. 
That is an independent review. No one else sees that review until two days before the meeting. So you really do get independent assessments of your grant. And you get at least two to three of them. It's only two days before the, this meeting actually takes place that the other reviewers assigned to your grant can have a look at all three reviews. The reason for this is first they want an independent review of each document, but secondly they want to foster discussion because this is an all-day meeting, sometimes a two-day meeting, during which only 40% of the grants that are submitted are actually discussed. Each of these people, independently of each other, submits a preliminary score on the grant. Those scores that fall in the bottom 60% are not discussed. The top 40% are discussed. I'm not going to go into detail about this, but it's a long, drawn-out process. The point is that you need to Think about the people in this room because they're the only people who are going to decide whether your grant scores well or not. I need to make it very clear that these people do not discuss the F word at all. Never do. They're not allowed to. All they can talk about is the quality of the science in your application. Now, obviously, the quality of the science in your application is highly correlated with whether you're going to be funded or not. And everyone here is an active researcher. They know what their score does to a particular investigator. So it's not as if they're unaware of what funding's about. But by policy, they're not allowed to discuss funding. OK. Now, a point about sanity. A grant is not a publication. It should never be considered a publication and you should not write a grant as if it were a publication. A grant is a conversation. It's a conversation between you and two or three other people in the world, essentially. Those people in the room in the slide I showed you just now. You need to write your grant in a very formal way, but it's still a conversation. You need to convince these two to four reviewers that you have a really sensational idea and you know how to execute it. It turns out that although study sections are comprised of experts in particular fields, and there are lots and lots and lots of study sections, because there are so many grants that are received, it may be the case that only one and possibly two people in the room are really experts in your particular field of research. That means that the way you write a grant needs to take that into account. An expert will not be offended by being reminded of things that you and she may consider obvious. The other two or three reviewers will really appreciate being brought up to speed or reminded of the subject matter. You should not write a grant exclusively for a world's expert in your field. You should write the grant more generally so that all the members who, of that study section who read your grant will understand it. Study section assigns three reviewers, the first reviewer, a second reviewer, and a third or reader. The first reviewer is typically the expert, the second is knowledgeable, and the third is typically outside the field. But the scores that each of those reviewers assigns to your grant are weighted equally in the determination of the score. And reviewers are people too. I know it's hard to believe, but they do have a heart. And they have a busy schedule. With 10 to 15 grants or other grants that they're reading, it's really important for your grant 
to stand out. Because NIH is starting to go back to a ranking system in which each reviewer may want to look at their 15 grants and decide which of these is, is head and shoulders above the rest and which of these is the worst. Strangely, um, reviewers like me at study section love badly written grants because they're the easiest ones to score and dismiss. It's the well-written grants that are the hardest ones to decide between. A rule of thumb about reviewers and grant reviewing is, given equal quality science, the better grant will get the better score. But science does trump writing. So you have to have good science in your grant. It can't just be a Nobel winning uh, author's work, it needs to be a really, really good scientific piece of work. Now, grant scoring is really quite arcane, but it's understandable once you know the system. And as with many things, there's a right way, a wrong way, and in this case, there's the government way. The government way is backwards. The lower the score, the better the grant. I'll say that again. The lower the score, the better the grant. Scores are not as important as percentiles. How is the grant rated against all the other grants in three, three consecutive meetings of study section? That's what a percentile is. And funding at, an, at the next level is decided by percentiles, not raw scores. And it really helps to see how study section works, how the review process works. There's, in fact, a YouTube video showing a mock study section. I strongly recommend that you have a look at that because I don't have the time this afternoon to give you a blow-by-blow -blow description, but it's very, very interesting and very informative. And I also strongly recommend that you talk to people like me and, and colleagues that you have in your departments who have sat on study section who have reviewed grants for an inside look at what the process is like and they will regale you with all sorts of stories of strange and wonderful things. I've often said to uh, students who I teach this grant writing class too, um, the peer review process is a little bit like democracy. It's the best of a bad set of alternatives. I mean, would you prefer to have your uh, legislators determine who gets funding or someone from Texas uh, in, in the US Congress decide who should get funding? I don't think so. Um, should we decide who gets funding? Absolutely. I would vote for that in a minute. Yes, I would decide I would be funded, obviously. So somewhere in the middle there is the NIH process. It is not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. And they keep fine-tuning it. You'll learn about that with the resubmission process. Now, and again, I'll say it because it's important, you cannot take this process and the results of this process personally. It really does lead to madness. If, as a psychologist, I were to have a rat pressing a bar on the reinforcement schedule that scientists win NIH awards, the rat would starve to death. It's tough, and the um, results can be quite difficult to deal with. All right, so let's suppose that I'm going to come up with a brilliant idea, the best thing since sliced bread. And here I'm going to illustrate that by my wonderful tree swing. That's the idea. Unfortunately, the design around that idea gets a little more complicated than we'd like. Writing becomes a real struggle and then finally, we get an application that at least functionally looks something like the beginning, but is nowhere near as good as we'd hoped. That's what designing and writing a grant can look like. Designing a grant is at least 50% being informed. There are three different sources of information I want to talk to you about today. 
First and most obviously the grant application itself. The grant application always comes with a set of instructions and you need to read them because everything you need to know about submitting that grant is in the instructions. If you don't read the instructions and OSP receives your grant and you've made some fundamental errors, you could be put back three to six months because you can't submit it in time. You haven't read the instructions. The second and perhaps most important thing is that people don't realize reviewers are told how to evaluate grants and that is not hidden or mysterious. There are websites for reviewers just like there are for applicants and you can go to those websites and see what reviewers are told to do. It's that simple. There are, there are no hidden agendas, there are no secrets, but you need to know where to look and I'm going to show you how to do that in a couple of slides. Thirdly, you really need to know what's already out there. It can't be any more embarrassing than to have a grant and you have someone at study section say to the rest of the group, oh, I did this experiment five years ago. So obviously you need to be very, very familiar with the published literature. You need to own it. Because it may be the case that people you're reading about are on your study section. But what do you do for research that hasn't been published yet? Well, you go to meetings, Society for Neuroscience or whatever local or national meeting you have. Go to the meetings and find out what other people are doing. That gives you a little more information about whether your idea is novel or not, whether it's already been done or not, or, and this is the third piece, if someone's planning to do it. All NIH and NSF grants that are awarded are published in abstract form. I'm going to show you a research tool that's freely available that not many people utilize or realize. You can go in and actually search all of the funded grants at NIH to see if your idea is being thought about and people have planned to do research and have proposed experiments to do even before you put pen to paper or finger to keyboard. And the next important thing about designing a grant is you need to find mentoring support. You cannot do this in splendid isolation, especially for new investigators. It just doesn't work that way anymore. You need to find people, more than one usually, who can help you through this process. And here are some considerations in finding a mentor. You for the mentor and the mentor for you. You have to be able to respect the person's opinion and their science. You have to be responsive to their suggestions as they have to be responsive to your requirements to review the document. It has to be a two-way street. And you have to plan this months in advance. This is not a week's scale. This is a month's scale, at least. You and the mentor or mentors have to be rather resilient because there's going to be differences of ideas. You may think you know better. That's up to you and your mentors to decide. And the mentor should definitely be a resource. You need to find people who are senior enough to have been there, done that but not so senior to be jaded about the process. And be prepared for some tough love. Not all ideas are good ones and not all experimental designs are perfect. But you need to approximate that as closely as possible and that will involve talking to mentors. And Dr. Muneer would suggest that we probably even need to have a group of faculty review grants, especially from junior investigators, before they leave the institution. Because in some cases people are submitting grants that don't do very, very well and unfortunately they eventually start to reflect on the institution. Because if study section keeps getting grants from WVU that don't score, then there's an impression that WVU faculty aren't writing good grants and that can permeate. You don't want that to happen.
This is my collection of comments on the scoring criteria for a grant. And I'm sure we can make these slides available to people so you don't need to write copiously about everything I'm saying that's already on the screen. Your score that you receive for a grant is based on the overall impact. Reviewers are told, and here, this, is, this is where you go to the website, you can actually read these instructions for reviewers. They are told to evaluate the probability of whether the research will exert a sustained, powerful influence on the research field. That is impact. If this grant is going to change the field, fill a knowledge gap, then it's a good grant. The overall impact is the score, and there are some other criteria that, that are contributed by the following criteria of significance. Does the project address an important problem? Investigator, you are evaluated as an investigator. Your qualifications, your collaborators, if you have an investigative team, whether you are in fact an independent investigator or a glorified postdoc, all of these things come into consideration. If you are an early um, investigator or a, or a new investigator, that you're just becoming an independent investigator, do you have the appropriate experience and training? These are things that reviewers are told to evaluate and they are told that it should reflect on the impact score of your proposal. The most important, other than significance and impact probably, is this work innovative? It doesn't have to be, but it really helps if there's innovation in what you're proposing to do. Not just in terms of the methods you're using, but innovation in terms of the approach and the idea itself. Now, approach is really a big category. This is one where the reviewers are actually looking at how you've designed the experiments. Let me repeat that, how you've designed the experiments. They're not interested necessarily in detailed methods. You've only got 15 pages in an R01 application. You don't have the room to go into a song and dance about all the different gels you're going to run with the different solutions. Don't want to know. We want to know how you've designed the experiment, how you've laid it out as a logical series of steps to answer a question. That is what the design and the approach is all about. And we're asked to look for well-reasoned and appropriate overall strategy, methodology, and analyses. You have to tell us how you're going to analyze the data, not just how you're going to run the experiment. You have to deal with potential problems, alternative strategies. And let me point out that because these are the instructions that reviewers get, wouldn't it make sense if you were to write your grant addressing these issues face on by using these as actual headings in your grant? If I'm looking for potential problems and I have to go through four pages of cl closely typed text, it's going to be hard for me to evaluate whether you've thought about potential problems. Use a heading, potential problems and their solution. Bold it, underline it. I don't have to look very hard. I'm very grateful to you for having done that because it makes my job as a reviewer much easier. Are the experiments feasible? Remember, these are at least one of them, but probably two of them are experts in your field. They, you can't pull the wool over their eyes. They will think about the experiments very, very closely. In fact, reviewers spend 75% of their reviewing time evaluating your approach. Not reading your literature review, which you've probably spent 95% of the time writing, and then throwing in some experiments because that's what a grant requires. Uh-uh. Reviewers are really looking at your approach. They assume you know the literature. They assume that what you're writing about is important or you wouldn't have written about it but they are really, really interested in how your experiment is laid out, how it is thought through, and whether or not it will yield results that have an impact on the field. And all of those things I've just said should be headings in your grant. Impact, underline, this is the impact. Significance, this is the significance. Innovation, this is why it's innov innovative or innovative, depending on where you're from. Um, 
Preliminary studies are important. Don't let anyone ever tell you that you can write a grant without preliminary studies. NIH says it. Some mentors say it. It's BS. You have to have some sort of preliminary data. But don't panic because I'm going to talk about preliminary data in a bit. How do you find out what's already funded? This is really washed out. I'm sorry about this. This is NIH report. This is a website. I have the URLs at the end of the slides. This is a searchable database where you can look uh, for investigators. You can search text. You can search anything you want at NIH looking for grants. And here is an example of a search for a principal investigator called Shrews. Here is a grant that you can see. Um, and look, and look at that. My abstract is right there in black and white. Word to the wise. If you have proprietary information or stuff you don't want people to see, do not. Do not put it in the abstract. Because if it's awarded, it becomes a public record, just like my abstract for a particular grant. This search engine also allows you to look at details. You can look at how much money each grant is awarded. So if you're a postdoc or looking for a, um, a collaborator, this is a powerful tool to find out whether they've in fact got money to help you out, whether they've had a history of support. There's another tab here called the history. It talks about the, the history of, of this particular grant, and this is in its sixth year, so it's a, it's a renewal. There are sub-projects, similar projects, really powerful. If you find that someone is doing something not quite related to you by searching through the CRISP database or the NIH reporter database, you can go to this tab and look for similar projects and start to get an idea of what the field is doing. Because you really have to remember that your research and your proposal is being placed in the field. It is not in isolation. So it has, to, it has a context. And you need to point out as you write your grant why it should be rewarded or funded in the context of other research taking place. All right. So designing a grant, you need a good research idea. You need a powerful research idea. It can't just be something run of the mill every day. It really needs to stand out, particularly in the extremely competitive environment we find ourselves in now at NIH. Your proposal has to answer a question. You have to propose a very important question and provide an answer. And you need to match what the agency needs, because there are different agencies at NSF and NIH, and depending on what they want. For example, um, some of you may be looking at cancer. Don't send it to neurology unless it's cancer of the brain send it to the Cancer Institute. Are you doing basic, clinical, or translational? This is a CTSI seminar, so we're thinking about clinical and translational science. The best grants actually combine at least two of these components. Basic science allows you to think about mechanism. If you're writing a basic science grant, if you don't have a, a specific aim about mechanism, go home because NIH is not interested in purely descriptive grants if they're basic science grants. Clinical, obviously, you need to think very carefully about the populations you're going to be studying, and NIH is very, very concerned about that. They will scrutinize everything you have to say about the populations you're proposing to study. Gender equality, racial Whatever, all those issues are going to loom very large in the evaluation of your grant, and similarly for translational. The grant must, again, must make an impact on the field. Not science in general, not the world, but the field in which you're doing your investigation. It would be better if it did the former, but it has to do the latter. It's really important that your research be feasible. It's great to have a great idea, but if you cannot execute, if you can't write a grant that actually attacks that idea in a clear way, then the grant will not 
receive support. And here is something that I want you to think about carefully. I'm not going to belabor the point, but design an ideal, underlined, ideal research plan. Because a grant, after all, is prospective. It's what you're going to do. That's why it's not a publication. A publication is retrospective. It's what you've done. It may turn out that the first experiment doesn't work the way you want it, so you have to tweak it. At NIH, that's okay. But you really must design the ideal research plan with all the appropriate controls and a complete design. Again, your reviewers are not mugs. They are going to know whether your design makes sense, if it's feasible, if it's doable. The major criticism of most new investigators is that they are overly ambitious. They design too many experiments and too many specific aims, which means they don't really conceive of what it takes to do the experiment. So there's a, there's a balancing act here between what's reasonable, what's doable, and what's ideal. Okay, I've said this before, I'll say it again. Your grant is not a publication, it's a conversation. It's a conversation with two or three people, but it has to be a formal conversation. You can't say, so guys, this is what I'm thinking of doing. That's not going to fly. It has to be rather formal. And it's a one-sided conversation. So you have to imagine the other side of the conversation. You have to imagine saying, I'm going to do this experiment with um, three groups, 20 people per group. And then the other person, the reviewer, is saying to you, have you powered that? Do you know that 20 people are going to be enough? You've got to think that through because the reviewers will. That's why I mean a conversation. It's only one-sided. But you've got to imagine the other side of the conversation. When you write a grant, you have to hit all of these review criteria. Impact. What is the impact on your field, not on society in general? Significance is an important distinction I want to draw between the significance of the problem, let's say Alzheimer's disease, which is important and you give it a paragraph, and the significance of your specific proposal. You give that much more space. Everyone understands that Alzheimer's is a problem, duh. Why is your particular application significant in dealing with the problem? The investigator or investigators with collaborative research, you need to have a good biosketch. You need to have demonstration of independent research or the potential for independent research. You have to have evidence of publications, particularly in this area. If you're new, then you don't have to have as many publications. If you're more senior, you need to have a washing list. Innovation means that your research will move the field forward. Regardless of what the field is, you need to actually physically advance the field in its knowledge, in its procedures, and in its treatment. Your approach has to be a detailed battle plan. You have to think through everything about the experiments, from soup to nuts. Surprisingly, the environment also features. You need to make sure that you have the stuff to do what you want to do, or you can get it. If you're a junior investigator in particular, you need institutional support. If you're a clinician, you need to have guaranteed time. All of those things need to be documented because all these reviewers have been there. Some of them are clinicians. They're not going to be befuddled if you have a clinical load that's, that's 40, 50 hours and then you're proposing to do another 30 hours worth of research. That ain't going to fly. You need a letter from your departmental chair or from whomever saying you have protected time. Now, getting down to the details of the approach. Preliminary data. Everyone freaks out because they don't have preliminary data. A word to the wise. Preliminary data are preliminary to the proposal, not to the research. 
In other words, if you have data that you've already published, it becomes preliminary data for your proposal. You can, and most people do, include published data as part of their preliminary data section. That doesn't mean you shouldn't be collecting preliminary data. Oh yeah, reviewers insist on preliminary data. And that's especially true for younger investigators because you may not have a large body of research, a large body of preliminary data. And if you've got a startup package which is modest, there's no way you're going to be able to collect preliminary data from two or three different areas. You're going to focus on one area. When you're designing the approach or writing the approach, you are talking about the design, the layout, the logic of the experiments. Don't waste my time describing details of methods. If they've been done before, refer to them. If you need to describe them briefly. Here's a trick that I use. If I'm running short of space in these 15 pages and I have a figure of preliminary data, I use the caption part of that figure to describe the methods. Now why would I do that? NIH and NSF require a certain font size. That's in the application itself. You can squeeze down the fonts in the figure captions. Yeah, you're laughing. It's true. It's a very clever trick. Uh, you can squeeze down the font size in the figure legend to get it down to about nine or even eight and get a lot more text in. You have to design experiments that will answer the question. So you need to be very clear about what your question or questions are. Then when you design your experiments, they need to step through and show in a logical manner how you're going to answer that question. Specific aims must be independent. You need at least, well, some people get away with one, but I would say at least two specific aims and probably not more than four or five unless they're individual experiments. What I mean by specific aims are independent. Mm. I'll try and do this quickly. Let's suppose Harry Potter decides to go back to Hogwarts as a faculty member and just before he arrives he goes to Privet Lane and sees that Dudley and Uncle Vernon have almost halved in weight. They have lost a dramatic amount of weight and he's dumbfounded. He goes to the fridge and sees that there's a, there was a jar of gillyweed that he forgot and that it's almost empty. And his hypothesis is, I know what. Those crazy muggles have eaten gillyweed, and it hasn't given them gills, but it's affected their metabolic syndrome. So I'm going to write a grant to the Ministry of Magic when I get to Hogwarts, and my hypothesis is that gillyweed reduces metabolic syndrome. Specific aim one is to determine whether gillyweed affects metabolic syndrome. Specific aim two is that I'm going to determine the mechanism by which gillyweed reduces metabolic syndrome. Unbeknownst to Harry, Vernon and his son Dudley have actually gone and watched Biggest Loser. And they've been inspired to start working out. And it has nothing whatsoever to do with the gillyweed. Specific aim two that I've just told you about is completely dependent on specific aim one working out. That is deadly, absolutely deadly to a grant application and reviewers will ding it immediately. Specific aims can be interrelated but one cannot be dependent on the other. I said specific aims. Experiments in contrast may and sometimes should be dependent on each other. Because experiment two may depend on the results of experiment one. That's fine, because it's within a specific aim. But two specific aims or three specific aims cannot be dependent. You need to have a potential problem section and you need to be able to have solutions. A word to the wise. Never ever list a potential problem unless you have the solution to it. There's no way you want to give your reviewers ammunition to shoot you down yourself. They'll find it by themselves. 
So do not list potential problems unless you know. It's, it sounds a little game-like, and in some ways it is. But that's important. You need to tell the reviewers what you expect to happen, because that means you've thought through the experiment. You've thought it through to its logical conclusion. This is what I expect to have. If you have the room, put in some figures of expected results. As long as you indicate that they're expected results, it sometimes helps the reviewer understand it. Provide benchmarks for success, especially for new techniques and untried techniques. Provide a timeline, because that's a very simple way of giving the reviewers an understanding of how the whole thing hangs together. If you have room, future directions are a really great place to stuff a lot of things that you couldn't get into the grant itself. So talk about what you would do if this worked. Let's suppose it gets funded. Then what am I going to do in five years from now? Now, the grant submission process. I'm going to go over a little bit because we started late, if that's okay. Which agency? It's really important to determine which agency you're going to submit a grant to. As I said before, if you're doing cancer, don't go to um, neurology unless it's brain cancer. You can determine and should determine which study section is going to review your grant. It's actually critical that you do that. You need to go to the NIH website and look at all the different study sections and read what it is that they review and decide which of those is most appropriate for your review. NIH not only lists what the study sections review, it lists who the permanent members of the study section are. By permanent, I mean those people who have four or five years on study section. Yes, it's a lot of work. Imagine, five years, 15 grants, two or three times a year. That's a heck of a lot of reviewing to do, which means they get very good at it. If you find a particular study section, have a look at who's a member. First of all, do you recognize the name? If you don't, that's a problem, because that means either the study section is inappropriate or you don't know the literature well enough, because these are usually fairly prominent people in the field. Hey, and get smart folks. If you recognize the name and it's relevant to your area, for heaven's sake, cite their work. It's very self-serving, but it makes sense, doesn't it? If you have someone on study section who's going to review your grant about something that they know about, at least acknowledge the fact that you recognize them. You want to write a cover letter with your grant. That's an important thing to do. You specify the institute. If there is more than one institute that's pertinent, pick the one that pays better. I'll explain that in a few minutes. In your cover letter, specify the institute, and if you know a study section, specify it and ask for it. Now, this is a little bit controversial. If there is a member on the study section, you say, oh my gosh, my mentor and she are at total loggerheads. They hate each other. How am I possibly going to get a fair and objective review? You say just what I said. In order to obtain a fair and objective review, I would request that Dr. Smith, Dr. Jones, not review the grant. You usually have to provide grounds, and don't do this too often because you start to develop enemies. But do use it if you feel that your grant is potentially threatened by a particular reviewer. NIH referral will usually concede to your request. The language is fair and objective review. Now, resubmission. 99.5% of grants need to be revised and resubmitted. I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. That's why you can't take it personally, because you will go crazy. Think about how it is you're going to revise or resubmit. For NIH, you're allowed one resubmission in answer to critiques. NSF, you're allowed multiple, but you have to wait at least a year, and the grant has to be fairly uh, seriously rewritten. In April, NIH completely changed its policy about resubmissions. 
In the old days, you could resubmit till you were blue in the face. Then they decided that was just too much work for study section. They said, you can only have one resubmission. You can only submit it after you get your written critiques. But then they realized that there are junior investigators who only have one particular area in which they're focused, and they only have one area where there are preliminary data. It's really unfair to ask them to completely change or at least significantly change their research area or research direction because they didn't get a funded grant. Now, you can resubmit your grant as many times as you like, but it cannot be described as or identified as a resubmission. It has to be a new submission. You cannot submit a new submission until you've received your critiques. Finally, you may not refer to previous scores or critiques. Obviously, you change the grant as much as you could to address those. But as far as NIH is concerned, it's a brand new grant. And all of this, of course, is published at the NIH website. You need to decide whether you think it's worth resubmitting the grant. If your scores are all in the nines, forget about it. If your scores are all good, but the approach is a six or a seven, it may not have been discussed, but otherwise it's a pretty good grant then you should think seriously about a resubmission. And that resubmission is now 16, not 15 pages, because you get an entire page to address the critiques. Show how you've improved the grant and specifically talk about them. Now, this is really, really, really important. Do not piss reviewers off. If you want to get argumentative, don't resubmit your grant. Because the last thing a reviewer wants to hear is, no, you're wrong. It's really this way. Address the critiques, not the person. Address them politely. If you are at loggerheads with their opinion, express yours, but do it politely. If you can, in good conscience, change whatever it is you need to change in order to address that critique, do so. I have a case in the last 18 months where the original, original score I got on an R01 renewal was not discussed, which means that it was in the top and the bottom 60%. <clears throat> it, was, it was traumatic. But I was actually able to address all the critiques and got it funded in the next round. So do not be devastated if you have a not discussed. If you have scores of nines, be devastated. But if the scores are good and it just happens that it's outside the range because there were 40% of the grants that were better than yours, that doesn't mean yours is bad. It just means that there were better grants. And you have to remember that. Each study section meeting, it's your grant compared to all the others. So if you resubmit, there are a new batch of grants against which you're competing. And it may not be the case that your score improves because these grants may be better too. So just remember that. All right, what about the F word? Funding. Agencies make different decisions about how to fund, so it's important that you choose the agency which works best for you. Some agencies, like NINDS, for example, score on merit alone. The top 20 grants get funded, regardless of the subject matter. Some institutes score um, by merit and a tax. They take 25% off the top of every budget, which means they get to fund five or six more grants. NIMH scores by, I mean, funds by score and policy fit. In other words, if you have a stellar grant, I've heard about this, if you had a stellar grant that went to NIMH and it doesn't fit their mission and their particular interests, it may not get funded. Whereas if it went to NINDS, it would be automatically fund it. And I've benefited from that. So merit and must fit programmatic requirements. Some institutions and some agencies, I don't know of many, 
look exclusively at policy fit, even if the score is bad, if it really is something important to the agency, they could fund it. And finally, West Virginia is an EPSCOR idea state, which means that we get some preferential treatment in some cases. If you're a new and or early investigator, you are reviewed separately from everybody else. The criteria are slightly different. You don't need as much preliminary data. You don't need to have as many publications. And your critiques are delivered to you much faster than we old fogies who are considered senior investigators. NIH by far and away is the biggest funder of health-related research in the country, perhaps in the world. NSF is the biggest funder of non-health-related research. But there are many, many other organizations that fund research, and with the tough climate we find at NIH and NSF, it may be worth your while to look at these less often visited agencies, particularly uh, in the federal government, CDC. The Prevention Research Center here at WVU has a CDC grant, and it's a very, very impressive grant. Department of Defense, USDA, there are lots of federal agencies other than NIH that fund research. Many, many organizations have peer-reviewed um, research funding, cancer, heart, Alzheimer's Association, ALS, the Ice Bucket Challenge, you've probably seen something about that. That's all to raise money to uh, support research. There are foundations. In some cases, foundations may only require a letter of intent or a letter of interest in order to garner significant funds. Here are some of the URLs which Dr. Lockman will make available. This is the, the granddaddy of them all, grants.nih.gov. Everything emanates from there. You can find anything and everything you need if you know where to look. Peer review, there's the URL. The NIH reporter, there. So, now that you've heard my pearls of wisdom, you have an idea, and the design looks exactly like the idea, and you've written it so brilliantly, it looks exactly like the idea, which looks like the design, and lo and behold, it's actually funded. Thank you very much. We have time for one or two questions. I've heard of um, situations where people receive feedback back that their grant application has been superb. I mean, they've gotten really good feedback, yes. but yet no funding dollars. Yes, the F word. Do you speak to that frequency and how often that might happen? Um, for the remote sites, the question is, some people get really, really good scores, get really great critiques, and yet the grant isn't funded. That's unfortunately a consequence of the times. There was a time when NIH expanded dramatically and people were paid um, 20 percentile or better. Now it's lucky to be single digits. There is not much you can do in that situation other than to submit it as a new grant and hope that the grants that are competing with you in the next cycle are not as good as the ones that were in your cycle. There really isn't much you can do because it, um, it's, it's strange. Reviewers are actually faced with the same situation. I've got two fabulous grants. They're equally meritorious, but NIH is forcing me to say something about one over the other. And the trouble is that the applicants treat that one ding as as a nugget, as gold, and they focus on that one ding because there's nothing else to focus on and it gets submitted as a new grant and reviewers may have all sorts of other comments. I've, I've had a grant that went through several cycles. It got an 18th percentile, which was not fundable. In the old days, it would have been. And it came back this time not discussed. It is a really crazy, crazy situation at NIH right now. And that's only indirectly answering your question. I'm actually throwing up my hands because it's so frustrating. There are people who get single-digit um, percentiles who aren't funded. And that's why you need to think about which agency you apply to because in some cases you may get funded if you have a policy fit or a mission fit where you wouldn't at another agency. Are there other questions? All right, I think there's another class waiting to come in, so thank you again for your attention.